thing in the morning.
who has made us worthy to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. O oh Lord, open now our lips. O oh God, make speed to save us. this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He sets up victory like walls and bulwarks. Open the gates so that the righteous nature, nation that keeps faith may enter in. Those of steadfast mind, you keep in peace. In peace because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For in the Lord God, you have an everlasting rock. For he has brought low the inhabitants of the height. The lofty city he lays low. He lays it low to the ground, cast it to the dust. The foot tramples it, the feet of the poor, the steps of the needy. The way of righteous is level. O oh, just one, you make smooth the path of the righteous. In the path of your judgments, O oh Lord, we wait for you. Your name and your renown 
are the soul's desire. Here ends the reading. reading from the Gospel of Mark. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders sent to Jesus some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? 
But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. And they brought one. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Jesus said to them, Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. Here ends the reading.
righteousness.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. My father was a career army officer. He served for 25 years. He was deployed to wars in Korea and Vietnam. He came back from Korea with a shattered leg and a case of PTSD that plagued him most of the rest of his life. And he came back from Vietnam with Agent Orange exposure that may have led to his final illness, a neurological disorder from which he died right around Memorial Day of 2020. His was a lifetime of service. And next to marrying my mother and being a father to two daughters he adored, it meant more to him than anything else he had ever done. His identity as an army officer, a veteran, a disabled combat veteran, and one who served in a unit and alongside a band of brothers he would never forget was an integral part of who he was. It was something he took pride in and struggled with the results of always. One of my earliest memories came during the time that he was deployed to Vietnam. I was three years old when he left, four years old when he returned. I was a toddler who adored her father. The year that he was gone, our family had to move out of army housing into an apartment just off the army post that was full of military families whose husbands and fathers were in Vietnam. My world was populated with women and children very few men. And of course, the wives and children knew each other, spent time with each other, grew close as families do as they wait and worry to know whether their loved one was coming home. And I suppose it's been the same for families of soldiers and sailors and Marines and airmen throughout history. The families left behind wait and worry together. Now, you can't talk about how my father served without also talking about how my mother served. That year that he was away in Vietnam, my mother had two important goals for me, her three-year-old. First, she wanted me to learn to read. Her theory was that children learn to read by seeing very large words, since their eyes, their eyes cannot yet make out small words, labeling familiar objects. So our apartment was filled with hand-lettered signs posted on or above objects, poster board with big red magic marker letters, table, chair, bookcase, bathtub. Her second big goal was that I should not forget my father while he was away. So on the wall next to my bed was the sign that mattered most of all an 8x10 glossy black and white photo of my father in his army uniform with big red lettering, Daddy. And I would lie in bed at nap time or in the morning and look at that sign and that photo. At nighttime, she would tuck me in bed and I would say to the sign, Good night, Daddy. That year, he was still gone when Christmas came. But one of my friend's fathers got leave and came home for Christmas. So one of my very earliest memories was visiting their apartment, hiding behind my mother, holding on to her leg, peering out at this big man with the deep, booming voice who had suddenly appeared in my world full of women and children. And I can picture him still sitting there next to the Christmas tree with colored lights gently flashing behind him. And I looked at him and I thought, so that's what a father looks like. That's what a father looks like. It's hard to calculate the cost of service in the armed forces. There are those who give their lives the last full measure of devotion, as Lincoln said in the Gettysburg Address. There are those who give their bodies and return disabled. There are those who give their peace of mind and return with PTSD or recurring nightmares. There are many who give long periods of time away from the ones they love. There are those, like my mother, who wait and worry 
and pray. There are widening fields of cause and effect from the decision to serve that touch those who serve, their families, friends, their neighbors, their countries, those who have never met them, but who are affected by their choice to serve honorably and selflessly. No one I know who has served believes that war is a good thing. They've been there and they know that it's not a good thing. But most of us recognize our human predicament, where people cannot agree on how to meet the basic needs of, of human life, so we can't find a way to live in peace, and service in the armed forces is a, is a choice that some people make for the greater good. In the Episcopal Church, in our baptismal covenant, we promise to strive for justice and peace and respect the dignity of every human being. And yet we live in a world in which we know that perfect justice has not yet arrived, and perfect peace is not possible without perfect justice. And we know that some people are called to extraordinary sacrifice to protect the dignity of every human being. And therefore, sometimes armed conflict results from the conviction that to ensure justice for all, some people have to sacrifice and serve and risk themselves for the sake of others. We do have the freedom in this country to argue with the causes that our country chooses to send people to die for. And we don't always agree on those causes, and yet that freedom to argue is itself a cause that those who serve have defended for our sake. We offer our gratitude to those who serve because we know that they have been willing to give themselves for a cause greater than themselves. For that cause, they are willing to follow orders, to go places they don't want to go, to do things they don't want to do, to experience things no human being should experience, all for the sake of others, for the sake of justice, and for the hope, ultimately, of peace. In the seventh chapter of Luke's Gospel, we read the story of a centurion, a Roman army officer far away from home, whose servant is ill and who asks Jesus to heal him. And he speaks words that are familiar to many Roman Catholics and others who speak it before communion. He says, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and let your servant be healed. And then he goes on to say, For I also, like Jesus, he implies, I also am a man set under authority, with soldiers set under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and I say to another, come, and he comes. He recognizes that, like him, Jesus obeys a higher authority, in Jesus' case, the authority of God that will eventually lead Jesus to sacrifice his life out of love for the world. And he sees that Jesus commands his own authority to heal suffering human beings. In all that Jesus does, he models the very being of God so that in looking at Jesus, we can understand God. We can watch Jesus and say, so that's what our Father looks like. The centurion understands this about Jesus. He sees that Jesus is not an 8 by 10 glossy, but the full living image of God the Father, as the letter to the Colossians says, the icon of the invisible God, because Jesus speaks and acts with God's authority. And Jesus is amazed at his faith, his deep understanding of what Jesus is about, and heals the servant. As we read stories like that, and stories like tonight's gospel reading of giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and giving to God what is God's, we realize that all human beings live under authority. Some choose to obey their own authority without regard to others, a choice that often leads to damage and destruction in this world. Some choose to obey the earthly authority of bosses and salaries. Some choose to work in the church serving God or in service organizations to help those in need as best they can. Some choose to put themselves at risk in the armed forces for the sake of justice, risking themselves out of belief in the principles on which their country was founded, 
accepting the authority of their military superiors, trusting that that authority will lead them to right action for the sake of the country and of the world. Yet we shouldn't read the gospel about giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and giving to God what is God's without, as, as creating a false dichotomy, as, as if those two things of giving to Caesar and giving to God are mutually exclusive. Jesus is clear that all things belong to God, including those things that belong to Caesar. All of us live under the authority of God, God who in Jesus gave his life for the sake of the world, God whose will for us is that all should live in peace with justice, God who asks us all to obey the law of love, to accept the ultimate authority of the God of love. Each of us is called to live according to that authority as God calls us to live, and each of us is called to give ourselves for the sake of others. Some of us choose to give themselves in military service, which means that under authority, unlike most of us, they may be called to give the last full measure of devotion. And that's a kind of obedience to authority that inspires our gratitude and leads to hope. Hope that ultimately God's way will prevail and war will be no more and no one will ever again be asked to give that ultimate sacrifice. Until that happens, we owe our full-hearted gratitude to those who put themselves in harm's way for our sake and for the sake of justice and peace. My mother's strategy to teach me to read worked. I learned to read and write quickly. And her other strategy worked too. I did not forget my father. He asked her to write him a letter every day while, she, while he was away, and she did. And every day, I would write on the envelope in big crayon letters, to daddy. And when he went to collect his mail, the clerk would laugh and say, let's see if we have anything for daddy today. Those letters kept him on my mind every day. And that eight by 10 glossy picture of my father labeled daddy in large red magic marker letters and hung above my bed helped me to remember what my own father looked like. The day he returned home from Vietnam, I was the first to see him at the airport and I broke away from my mother and ran and jumped into his arms. I didn't have any doubt about him because I knew what my father looked like. As we look at those who have served under the authority of the armed forces, let us always honor their willingness to sacrifice themselves for the sake of others, even when it sometimes means giving the last full measure of devotion, because that's what honor and selflessness and courage look like. And as we look at Jesus, let us always remember his choice to live according to the law of love, which we pray will someday lead to perfect justice and perfect peace in a day when war will be no more, because perfect love, peace, and justice is what our Heavenly Father looks like. Amen.
Good evening and welcome to St. Paul's Cathedral on this first live choral evensong in uh, over 18 months. It's so wonderful to welcome back our Bishop Susan and also uh, Dr. Frank, the Reverend Dr. Frank Munoz, our uh, diocesan missioner for the armed forces tonight, and all of you uh, to be back in our choral evensong world. May I ask anyone who is a veteran or currently serving to stand so that we can thank you for your service. evening choral services, live services, this year. Um, on the first Sunday of Advent, two weeks from tonight, November 28th, we will have a service of Advent lessons and carols. And then on the fourth Sunday of Advent, December 19th, we will have a service of Christmas lessons and carols. And I hope that you will join us. And we all hope that it won't be too much longer before we are offering choral even song every Sunday again, as we used to. Next week, our Sunday Forum at 9 a.m. Uh, will be about telling our faith stories, and it will be led by the Reverend Peter Del Nagro, who will tell his story of ministry and encourage us to think about ours. We are still inviting nominees for chapter. That's our board of directors, our spiritual leadership group. Um, you can talk to me after the service if you'd like more information about serving on chapter. There will be an election in January. Our pledge campaign is doing extremely well. Thank you to everyone who has pledged already for next year. Next Sunday will be our in-gathering Sunday at the morning services, and there will be a picnic brunch in Balboa Park following the 10.30 service to celebrate the in-gathering. Don't forget that we have organ recitals every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. They're just 30 minutes long. They are free. You can come and listen to them here, or you can watch them live streamed or on the recordings. And now please stand for our closing prayers. Let us pray. Almighty God, we commend to your gracious care and keeping all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations. Give them courage to face the perils which beset them, and grant them a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be, through Jesus Christ our Lord. O oh, Judge of the Nations, we remember before you with grateful hearts the men and women of our country who in the day of decision ventured much for the liberties we now enjoy. Grant that we may not rest until all the people of this land share the benefits of true freedom and gladly accept its disciplines. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth forever. The blessing, mercy, and grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.